So greetings once more. It is again truly a blessing to be together today. Even if we are separated by physical distance, we are brought together by this annual feast day here on Pentecost weekend. It is, as has been mentioned, a, a challenging time, a challenging time for our world. Locally, national, nationally, and again, uh, for the world, the entire planet. With all these things happening, many have asked the question, are we in the end times? Is this the beginning of the tribulation? When are the two witnesses going to appear? appear? When will the four horsemen begin their ride? When will we see armies battling together for our, our joining together at Armageddon for the battle against Jesus Christ? And ultimately, when will Christ return? When will the kingdom come? These are all questions on everyone's mind, and they're fair questions to ask. But none of those is the most important question that we need to be asking ourselves right now. The question we should be asking ourselves is rooted right in the middle of the book of Jeremiah. Here on the Feast of Pentecost as first fruits, this phrase, this statement that Jeremiah makes, he doesn't ask a question. He makes a statement, but it makes us ask a question. That's right in the middle of the book of Jeremiah, and it has great, great meaning for us as partakers of the new covenant, as first fruits. Jeremiah, as you know, he was a prophet. He lived uh, after the time that uh, the northern ten tribes had fallen, had been taken captive by Assyria. Uh, he was living in Jerusalem, uh, in the kingdom of Judah. And he was a messenger to God's people about the coming invasion uh, of Babylon, among other things. So we're going to begin in Jeremiah today, right in the middle again, where we don't necessarily see a question, but we read a statement. A statement that provokes some questions for us. It's in Jeremiah 31. As you're well aware, this is where we read about the new covenant, the covenant that was be new to those who would first read and hear this message, but is the covenant that you and I live under today. I'm just going to take a moment and read this section of scripture and just think about this and what this means to you as a first fruit. Jeremiah 31, we'll start in verse 27. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up, to break down, to throw down, to destroy, and to afflict, to afflict so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall, they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers and the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I shall make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. We know and recognize this, of course, as the promise of the new covenant 
that was to come. But do we really get what that means? As people who have lived our lives entirely under the new covenant, do we get what that means? This isn't a sermon about the covenants, about the old covenant versus the new, but I think it's appropriate here on the Feast of Pentecost, the, the day in which, although the new covenant really began to be instituted at the death of Jesus Christ, it became fully implemented on that first Feast of Pentecost after his death in Acts chapter two. Matter of fact, let's go ahead and turn there. You may wanna leave a, a marker in Jeremiah. We'll be coming back there a little later on. But let's just read this account of what happened on that first Feast of Pentecost after Jesus Christ's death. Acts chapter two, verse one. Said when the day of Pentecost had fully come, said they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a, uh, a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You know, this has been a magnificent sight to behold. And there were many miracles, you know, the speaking in the tongues. It's you know, not some understand, not some ununderstandable language, but it was been in the native tongues as it goes on to explain a little bit later on. There were a wide variety of people. And, and one miracle was that those speaking could speak in this foreign language that they didn't normally speak. And the other miracle, of course, was that people heard in their own language. So there's a, a great variety of, of amazing things that would have happened on that first day of Pentecost. But we see God's spirit being poured out and being given. And it was only then with God's spirit that the new covenant can really come into complete and full existence. It started at the death of Jesus Christ, but then it became fulfilled that day. The analogy that kind of came to mind is the thought of if you buy a house. Typically today, if you buy a house, you have what's called a closing. You sit down and you go through and you sign your name on a bunch of papers and you sign the bottom line and the sale of the house is complete. But most often you don't get to go into that house right away. There's typically a time frame, a few days, maybe a few weeks before you get occupancy. Here we see occupancy of a different sort. The covenant became written. The bottom line was signed when Jesus Christ died. But occupancy, the Holy Spirit living, dwelling in people didn't happen until that first day of Pentecost. Now for you and I, when we received God's spirit, it wasn't with such fanfare. We went through baptism. We went underwater. We were washed of our sins. We put to death the old man. We came up out of that water and a minister of God laid hands upon us and asked God to give us his spirit. So it might not have been with all the fanfare that we read about in Acts 2 here, but the result is the same nonetheless. We became filled with God's spirit. Considering that, we should think about Jeremiah 31 in a bit of a different way than what that original audience would have thought about it, how they would have understood it. God makes a statement here through Jeremiah that should lead us to ask much deeper questions. Deeper questions than who the beast and the false prophet or the two witnesses are. Deeper questions than, when will the horsemen ride? Is this the tribulation? Deeper questions even than, is this the end of the age? The deeper question that we, as partakers of the new covenant, as first fruits, should be asking isn't, is this the end? The question that you and I need to be asking ourselves 
is are we ready for the end? Are we ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Now, by that, I don't mean, am I tired of all the things that are happening in the world? Am I tired of the aches and pains my physical old body has, and I just want to be out of this and into a new spirit body? I think the answer for every one of us is an overwhelming and resounding yes. Yes, we are ready. But I think the question we need to ask is a little more serious, a little more of a self-exam sort of a question. The question that we need to ask when I mean, when I ask, are we ready? is that if Jesus Christ began to return to earth right now, would you and I be rising in the air to meet him? Or would we be standing on the ground wondering what happened? What went wrong? That's a hard and heavy question. But, as first fruits, as partakers of that new covenant, it's one that we need to be asking. Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about if we have God's Holy Spirit, then you will have eternal life. You will rise in the air to meet Jesus Christ at his return. That's a guarantee. The purpose of this message today isn't to create doubt. It's not for us to be fearful. It's not for us to stay up, uh, lie you know, in bed, awake at night, wondering, do I have God's spirit? That's not the purpose at all. Rather, the purpose of this message is that considering we do have God's spirit, how do we see Jeremiah 31? Do we see the warnings that are there for you and I? to take our calling seriously. Today, I want us to look at three warnings from Jeremiah with the question, am I ready for the return of Jesus Christ in mind? Three things that although uh, they affected Jeremiah's original audience in a very physical way, affect us in a very deep, profound, spiritual way. If you like titles, I've entitled this message, Warnings from Jeremiah, for us as first fruits. Warnings from Jeremiah for us as first fruits. We're going to be looking at three warnings from Jeremiah today, posed as rhetorical questions. You know what a rhetorical question is, right? One is a, a question that you often silently ask yourself. It's not really a yes or no question, it's a question designed to make us think. It's a hard question. And on the Feast of Pentecost today, I want to ask these questions in hopes to inspire and challenge you, challenge me, each of us to take our calling very, very seriously. You've heard it said a lot in the past few weeks from the church as a whole. It's a time to cry aloud and spare not, not just to the world we live in, but to ourselves. So today we're going to look at some hard questions using the book of Jeremiah as our framework. The first warning that I believe we can take from Jeremiah here in this section of scripture actually has to do with a warning itself. Let's go back to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 27. Jeremiah 31 verse 27 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. This speaks to physical blessings of, of life, of families growing, of you know abundance of uh, crops, cattle, things along that lines. It says, It shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up, to break down, to throw down, to destroy, and to afflict, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. He says, yeah, I've caused some difficult things to happen. You know, it's a result of the choices that Israel and Judah made. They were picked up. They were plucked out. They were destroyed. But he said, you know, I'm going to plant. But did you catch what he said? 
He said, I've been watching. I've been watching. And as God watched, he didn't just sit back in silence. When he saw his people began to go astray, he gave a warning. He gave a warning at times through Jeremiah, through the prophets. So I think the first warning that we can take as New Covenant Christians from Jeremiah here in Jeremiah 31 is, am I ignoring the warning? Or have I heard the warning? History is full of stories about people who didn't hear warnings. You read about disastrous events like the Titanic or the bombing of Pearl Harbor when there were warning signs that could have been monitored a little bit closer and had they been adhered, perhaps disaster would have been avoided. You see things on the news with like the flash floods that we've had where there are warning signs on the road that say, don't cross over, you know, road washed out. People go around the signs, they ignore the warning. Oftentimes with disastrous results. You know, Israel, Judah, they were warned. You could look at virtually any page in the book of Jeremiah and see a warning. We'll just look at a few. Let's go to the beginning here of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1. Jeremiah 1, verse 14. Jeremiah 1, verse 14, it says, Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord. They shall come, each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against all its walls all around and against all the cities of Judah. I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness, because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worshiped the works of their own hands. The basic issue that Israel and Judah had was idol worship. They were worshiping false gods. You can read through uh, the Chronicles, you can read through Kings, and you can see where Kings uh, did better, did worse, fall followed uh, uh, the pagan religions and the countries uh, around them. And the nation worshiped false gods. That was the basic issue. Uh, the Northern 10 tribes fell captive first. Later, Judah uh, committed, uh, you might say, even, even worse sin is that not only did they worship these pagan gods, but they continued to try to worship God too. They were neither hot nor cold. They were lukewarm. But we see warnings continue throughout Jeremiah. Let's pick up a couple more. Jeremiah 2, verse 23, he says, How can you say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after the bales. See your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You are a swift dromedary or camel breaking loose in her ways. A wild donkey used to the wilderness that sniffs at the wind in her desire. and her time of mating, who can turn her away? All those who seek her will not weary themselves. In her month, they will find her. You now, what God is saying is like, this was like an animal during mating season. It, it wasn't difficult for these other nations or other gods uh, to sell themselves to Israel. Uh, they came looking. They came looking and they quickly went after other gods. Jeremiah 3, verse 12. It says, go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, return backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. You know, God pleads with them. You know, just please repent change go back to being the way you were the way the nation that i set you up to be jeremiah 4 verse 2 it says if you will return O israel says the lord return to me and i will put away your abomination out of the sight then you shall not be moved and you shall swear the lord lives in truth in judgment and in righteousness 
The nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. Jeremiah 5, uh, verse 7. He says, How shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by those who are not gods. When I had fed them to the full, then they committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlots' houses. They were like well-fed, lusty stallions, every one neighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord, and shall I not avenge myself on such a nation? You know, he pleads with them to repent, and then he says, if you're not going to repent, how can I let this go? How can I let this, you know, happen? You know, it's like a child maybe stealing out of the cookie jar. You might let it go once or twice with a little bit of a warning. But the time comes, there's going to be a more serious consequence, and that's what God points to. And of course, that's what happened. That's what happened. If we go towards the end of the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 52, Jeremiah 52, Jeremiah 52, just read uh, through here, summarizing a bit. It says, Now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, the Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all the army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. So it goes through and says, This is exactly what happened. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar came down, they built a siege there around uh, Jerusalem. Verse 8 says, But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, they overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. You know, he had tried to escape after the city was falling, said and all his army was scattered from him. So they took the king, they brought him back to the king of Babylon. Uh, verse 10, then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, killed the princes of Judah and Riblah, uh, in Riblah, and he also put out the eyes of Zedekiah. And the king of Babylon bound him in bronze fetters, took him to Babylon, and put him in prison until the day of his death. Now here we read about the king. And Jerusalem at that time in Zedekiah. There he was in prison, his eyes put out in chains. You know, and he was likely asking himself some very, very hard questions. What happened? What went wrong? Did I miss the warning signs? Well, the answer, of course, is yes, he did. As first fruits, do we recognize the warning signs all around us? The warning signs here in the book of Jeremiah, the warning signs throughout the Bible, the warnings perhaps that we've taken from this COVID-19 pandemic, the warning signs that will no doubt still be coming from the financial fallout from this pandemic, future warning signs, as people with God's Holy Spirit, unlike those in Jeremiah's time, the warning signs all around us should be screaming out clearly from God saying, look out, repent, change. Now is the time. Put whatever it is that distracts you from God all the little graven images that Israel and Judah had. Whatever images, whatever things we have in our life that distract us from God, whether they be physical things, whether it be, you know, lust for money, for power, sexual desire, whatever it is, or whether it's even something that controls us on an emotional level, fear doubt, worry, anything that can take us away from God. All those things can be idols and can lead us away from God, just as Israel and Judah were. You and I can't afford to ignore the warning signs. As people with God's spirit, as partakers of the new covenant, you and I can't ignore the warning signs. 
throughout the rest of the Bible, throughout Jesus Christ's ministry, the warning was made. Change. Repent. Look at your life, how you live, the choices you make, the things that are important to you. Are they focused on God? Are they focused on ourselves? What's our focus? We won't go through all those. Certainly we couldn't for sake of time, but we'll just turn to the very last one. The very last one in Revelation 22. Last words of Christ recorded in the Bible, Revelation 22. Verse 20 says, He who testifies to these things, we understand the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ to John. John recorded it, but it was the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's Jesus Christ here, of course, it's speaking. It says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. He says, Look out. Hear the warning. Listen to the things that your Bible tells you. See the warnings in our world around us. Look out. The question isn't when Christ will return. The question for us as God's people today, as first fruits, is are we ready for Christ's return? Don't ignore the warnings. Don't ignore the warnings. What happens after we receive a warning? What happens after something clearly happens, a warning is shouted out, we see it? All too often, our human reaction is to ignore it. Our human reaction is to ignore it, to not take it seriously. We go back to Jeremiah 31 here. Jeremiah gets into taking the warning seriously. He goes a little bit deeper. He gets into the subject of accountability, of accountability. Jeremiah 31 Verse 29, he says, In those days they shall no more, uh, they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which I broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. He says, everyone will be held accountable for their own iniquities, for their own sin. He says that if our teeth are being set on edge right now by the things that happen in the world around us or that happen in our lives, it's not the fault of somebody else. It's not something that someone else did. He says that the covenant that he made with the fathers, it was with the fathers. And by the time Jeremiah's time had rolled around, you know, the people were pretty disconnected from the covenant that they were living under. You and I, as people who chose to make that covenant of baptism, we can't say that. The second warning then we should be taking from Jeremiah is, am I making excuses? Am I making excuses? Are we playing the blame game to avoid taking responsibility for our own actions? We see this happen all the time. Certainly we've seen it here with the coronavirus. Politicians blaming each other from state to state about how they did this, how they did that. It will certainly be a, a huge subject of debate with the presidential election this fall. There's been allegations that doctors and hospitals are misdiagnosing and mislabeling things as coronavirus so they can get increased funds, all sorts of things. And of course, China is being blamed for it all. 
ancient Israel was no different. It was no different when it came to playing the blame game. Jeremiah 3, in Jeremiah 3, we start to kind of see an instance of how this was happening. Jeremiah 3, starting in verse 6. Jeremiah 3, verse 6, it says, The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has, back, uh, she has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done these things, return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. And remember, Jeremiah is writing specifically to those in Judah. Israel had already been taken captive at this point in time. But they characterized Israel and Judah as two sisters. And Judah was following the example of her sister Israel. It says she played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet for all these uh, treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord. Now, Judah doesn't play the blame game directly exactly here, but it's pretty clear they were taking an attitude. Well, you know, Israel did it for a long time. You know, they got away with it for an awful long time. We'll do a little better job and, and we'll worship God too. It says they did it in pretense. They pretended. They pretended they were worshiping the Baals. They were worshiping all their little figurines, their little statues made of wood, made of stone. And they were trying to worship God too. The New Living Translation puts it this way. It says, they pretended to be sorry. They pretended to be sorry. They were making a flimsy excuse in their heart, saying, well, sorry, God. Yeah, we, we did bad like our older sister did, but we'll be better. We'll be better. They were making a flimsy excuse on a pretense that they would be better. Later on, they began to blame the prophets. Jeremiah 5. Jeremiah 5, verse 12. This is God speaking, and he's characterizing the attitude in Judah at this time. And specifically here, he's talking about how Judah looked at the prophets that God had sent. Jeremiah 5, verse 12, it says, They have lied about the Lord and said, It is not he, neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. And the prophets become wind, for the word is not in them. Thus shall it be done to them. You know, the prophets certainly uh, had their blame, as we'll see in a little bit. But, you know, the people basically treated them as a bunch of windbacks. They said, oh, you know, they've been saying for years that there's going to be punishment for our sins. But nothing's happened. Nothing's happened. It's been fine. They were making excuses. You know, maybe they weren't making an excuse to God at this point. But they were making an excuse in their heart. They were justifying their own behavior. Again, the NLT puts it this way. It says, God's prophets are all windbags who don't really speak for him. Let their predictions of disaster fall on themselves. It's a bunch of hooey. They don't know what they're talking about. Nothing's happened. Again, it's true that there were some false prophets. Jeremiah 6 verse 13 shows that. God says, though, that doesn't fly for an excuse. Later on, after they had fallen after God's uh, hand of judgment had come and come down. You know, they were asking rhetorical questions. The book of Malachi is, is full of these types of questions. You turn over to Malachi for a moment. You'll see here some of the questions. Again, God is doing the speaking here, but he's characterizing the thoughts that were in his people. He's kind of having both sides of the conversation and he's asking, you know, some of the rhetorical questions or are, are, are basically putting into voice some of the things that were in mind of the people. 
after they had been taken captive after that time of captivity was was imminent. Malachi 1 verse 6. Malachi 1 verse 6 says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. Uh, to you priests who despise my name, yet you say, In what way have we despised your name? What? What do we do? What do we do wrong? God goes on to explain to them. He says, You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, In what way have we defiled you? By saying, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? Now, here they were directly violating the laws of the sacrifices. They're specifically told, uh, Leviticus 22, verse 19 and 20, not to offer a lame animal. But what they were doing is they were giving the worst to God and they were keeping the best for themselves. Malachi 2, verse 17. Malachi 2, verse 17. It says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, In what way have we wearied him? You know, he said that, you know, they've been praying and he said, You've worn me out with what you're saying. Reason being, of course, we read earlier in Jeremiah is that they had done things under a false pretense. And they said, he says, well, well, what do we say? They say, in what way have we wearied him? And he says, in that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Oh, where is the God of justice? Oh, these terrible things happened to us. We went into captivity. Why, God? Where are you, God? Why did these things happen? Where is the God of justice? You know, they tried to blame God. They tried to blame God. Why isn't God being fair? You know, there's a lot of those questions being asked right now, whether it be about the situation with the riots, whether it be about coronavirus. There's this outcry. What went wrong? What happened? I think we know and understand, those of us who live in this nation, what went wrong. Systematically over the years, God has been pushed out of our lives. No longer are the Ten Commandments taught in a school. Can't even put them out up in front of the courthouse. We don't acknowledge as a nation that we were founded on blessings from God. Through our court system, we've redefined what human life, what marriage is. And as a society, we say, well, what? Why did God leave us? Who left who? Who left who? Going back to the book of Jeremiah, we do see that Jeremiah, that the prophets did play a part. As mentioned earlier, they there was guilt there on their part. Let's look in Jeremiah 5. Jeremiah 5. And read a little bit. about what the false prophets, not the true prophets such as Jeremiah, but what false prophets had done. Jeremiah 5, verse 30, it says, An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. The system had been become corrupt. Prophets and priests were making uh, faulty judgments, decisions, basically giving justice to the higher bidder, which of course isn't justice. But God says, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's happened. But notice what he says about three quarters of the way here through verse 31. So the priests rule by their own power and my people love to have it so. He said people knew what were going on. Blaming the prophets, it's just a convenient excuse. It was just a convenient excuse. And he concludes here at the end of verse 31, something we should underline, a highlight in our Bible, a question to always ask ourselves. It says, but what will you do in the end? What will you do 
in the end. Not what did the prophets say? What did your pastor say? What will you do? As New Covenant Christians, making excuses is not an option for us. It can't be. I think we understand that and we see it said very clearly in Philippians, in the book of Philippians. Chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 12. Actually, in Philippians, there's a question asked or a, a statement made and then sort of a counter statement. The, the first part of the statement is in Philippians 1, verse 6. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, having God's spirit in us. What we think about here today on Pentecost, that's a perpetual reminder that God is working in us. And he says, God will complete this good work in you. That's God's part. We flip over to Philippians 2, verse 12, and it says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's our part. Jeremiah 5, 31, ask it, what will you do? Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, reminds us, we have to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. We are responsible for our own actions. We can't make excuses. Our real problems in life, not minor inconveniences, like having to stay home for a little while, having to wear a mask, but our real problems in life, they're our responsibility. It's not the grapes that our fathers ate that set our teeth on edge. As Jeremiah said, those are our own grapes that we ate. When you get down to it, that's the conclusion we came to at baptism. That's the conclusion we came to at baptism. Go back to Acts chapter 2. Consider here on this Feast of Pentecost, this sermon that Peter was giving. Gives this profound sermon. And he asked some hard rhetorical questions. Won't read through all of Acts 2. Maybe that's something you might consider doing a little later this afternoon as we're here on the Feast of Pentecost. But I'm going to highlight a couple of things. Acts 2, verse 36. This is after he had gone through and testified to them about Jesus Christ. He says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel surely know that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Who killed Christ? We did. At baptism, we come to that understanding. We recognize that it was because of our sin, Jesus Christ needed to die. It's not somebody else's fault. It wasn't the Jews. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't Judas Iscariot. It was us. And we take responsibility for that as people that have God's spirit. Verse 37, he says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter reached the hearts of the audience that day so deeply that the audience came to the point that says, I'm not making an excuse. I'm going to take responsibility for my actions. What am I going to do? What should we do about it? Verse 38, Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter gave the sermon that made people ask the right questions. Not when will Jesus Christ return, but what do I need to do to be ready for it? I'm ready to accept responsibility. I'm ready to not make excuses. You and I, at some point in time, our heart was pricked. We recognized that. We knew we had to take responsibility. We committed to go underwater, to put to death that old man, to ask God for help, ask God for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ask God, help us be accountable for our actions. Help me to quit making excuses. Going back to Jeremiah 31. Going back to Jeremiah 31, picking up and <clears throat> we'll pick it up in verse 33. Jeremiah 31, verse 33, it says, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You and I, we individually chose to make that covenant through the act of baptism. As first fruits with God's Holy Spirit, we simply cannot play the blame game. We need to accept responsibility and make the changes in our life we need to make. I have to read an excerpt from UCG's online Bible commentary on Jeremiah 31. See, it's summarized this way. It says, what we see then is that the offering of the new covenant to Israel and Judah at large, as described in Jeremiah 31, will happen in an ultimate sense after Christ's return. It is parallel to other passages foretelling the general outpouring of God's spirit in the latter days. However, he has already initiated the new covenant with the forerunner of Israel, his church, that's you and I today, his church to whom he has given the first fruits of the Spirit, Romans 8, 23, says to begin the process of transformation now. Very powerful, very powerful then, when we understand and read Jeremiah 31, not from the perspective of those in Jeremiah's time, but from our perspective here today. Our second warning then, that you and I, first fruits as partakers of God's spirit quit making excuses quit making excuses don't play the blame game take responsibility for your actions once we decide to take the warning seriously once we decide to stop playing the blame game and take responsibility, I think there's a third and final warning we can take from Jeremiah 31 here. Jeremiah 31, verse 34, says no more. So this is speaking to those under the new covenant, you and I today. Says no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Verse 34 projects forward to the kingdom of God, a millennial setting. It says they are forgiven. Sin is no more. There is no iniquity. Revelation 21 verse 8 makes it clear there will be no sin found in God's kingdom. Sin and the lack of understanding that leads to it will not be tolerated in the kingdom of God. It says there will be no need to teach because everyone will know. Now there's a, a bit of room for interpretation here. Here in Jeremiah 31 verse 34, is it specifically returning to the time, or is it specifically referring to the time after the millennium, after Satan's binding and release 
uh, after the old world is, is burnt up and there's a new heaven and a new earth and there are no longer humans to teach? Or does it refer to the thousand year reign of Christ? When the first fruits, when you and I become spirit beings and we're helping teach people, there'll be human beings, so there'll be sin, but it won't be tolerated. So there's a little bit of room to interpret exactly where Jeremiah 31 verse 34 would be. But in either case, any way you slice it, for those of us who are first fruits and partakers of the new covenant today, the time for us to learn, to educate ourselves on what we need to know, that time will already have passed. Now, I'm not saying that as spirit beings, particularly during the millennial reign of Christ, when we are working with other humans, I'm not saying that we won't continue to learn in some way. I fully believe we will. Kind of like someone who, who plays a musical instrument or who is an artist, they don't one day obtain perfection and say, oh, I'm not going to work on it anymore. You know, they continue to work and they continue to grow. But if we desire to rule and reign with Christ for eternity in that thousand years after Christ's return and before the new heaven and new earth, the question, the warning we can take is have we learned everything we need to learn now? Have we learned everything we need to learn now? now again, I believe we will continue to grow and refine our skills but the big hard lessons that we need to be learning in this lifetime, well, we have learned them. As we heard in yesterday's sermon, our go-to answer, well, we have learned for that to be with the love of God and not focused on ourselves, on pride. Well, we have learned not to be accepting of sin in our lives and make excuses. Well, we have learned to be truly yielded, truly submitted to God's spirit. Well, we have gotten past those basics as human beings. Have we overcome those basics? Or do you and I still have a few things yet to learn here and now? Jeremiah had worked hard at preaching the word. He was preaching an unpopular message to an unwilling audience in a hostile environment here when he wrote Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah worked hard, but you know what? His work wasn't over yet. He wasn't over yet. All the warnings, all those things Jeremiah had prophesied that God had spoken through him, they were getting ready to come to pass. Jeremiah's work wasn't done. Turn forward to Jeremiah 38. Jeremiah 38. Said so people had heard what Jeremiah had spoken. Some had. Verse 2, picking up, it says, Thus says the Lord, He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes over to the Chaldeans shall live his life. It shall be a prize to him, and he shall live. Thus says the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which they shall take it. Therefore the princess said to the king, Please let this man be put to death. Speaking of Jeremiah says, let this man be put to death, for thus he weakens the hands of the men of war who remain in this city, and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man does not seek the welfare of his people, but their harm. Jeremiah was being blamed. The people were continuing the blame game. They're saying, you know, the few people that are left here, the few warriors that we have, the things that Jeremiah says, they're scaring them. You know, this guy's giving people, you know, uh, you know, fear. He's that he's hurting them. He's not helping them. Of course, that wasn't true. He was trying to help them. But people said, this guy's a bad news bear. You know, he's saying all these bad things. He's bringing everybody down. 
he said, you know, the, those who were his adversaries said, let's get rid of him. Let, let's kill him. Verse five, it says, then Zedekiah, the king said, look, he is in your hand for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and they cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the king's son, which was uh, in the court of the prison. And they let Jeremiah down with ropes. And in the dungeon, there was no water, but mire. So Jeremiah sank in the mire. Do you know what Meyer is? He was in the dungeon, which is underground. Water and other things go downhill. The water wasn't there. While they were in the dungeons, they didn't have toilets to use. Jeremiah was knee deep, armpit deep in raw sewage. You know, we go through, we've gone through some things when we couldn't find toilet paper, or we have to say, oh no, I, you know, I have to use one ply instead of my normal two ply or whatever. You know, I can almost see Jeremiah in the millennium saying, oh, <laughs> you didn't have toilet paper? Let me tell you a story about when I didn't have toilet paper. <laughs> now, Jeremiah was literally up to his armpits, and you know what? But he kept working. He kept working. Verse 11. Verse 11. We see Jeremiah, fortunately, is, is rescued. It says, So Abed-Melech took the men with him and went into the house of the king uh, under the treasury and took from there old cloths and old rags and let them down by ropes into the dungeon to Jeremiah. You know, they didn't have, have really... Rope, proper ropes to use, they had to go get bits and pieces, a cloth bed sheet, something that you see out of a, a movie, you know. Um, they let them uh, down by ropes uh, in the dungeon of Jeremiah. Then Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, said to Jeremiah, please put these old cloths and rags under your armpit. So it seems that he was at least waist deep in this mire. Said, please put these old cloths and rags under your armpits and under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. So they pulled Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So he at least got out of the mire. Uh, but he wasn't, you know, exactly in, in a great state. He wasn't done yet. He was given an unpopular, hard job to do. He wasn't finished. We won't read the rest of the story of Jeremiah for the sake of time. There was still work to do. You know, people wanted to uh, uh, run away. Uh, he was allowed, you know, to stay in Jerusalem, not living in, in the, the pit. The people wanted to go to Egypt. You know, uh, God told them, no, don't go. Uh, they said, we're going anyway. And basically they, they took Jeremiah as a prisoner down there with him. But even after that, his work wasn't done. He had to prophesy unpopular messages about judgment that was going to come to Babylon, to Edom, to Damascus, other places. It's not all bad news. He got to prophesy some good news, too. He gets to tell Israel in chapter 46, verse 27, that they won't be destroyed completely. But the point for you and I here today is this. Even after what seems really hard times are past, there's still work to do. We're not told all the personal life lessons that Jeremiah learned along the way, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that both before and after being stuck in that pit of mire, Jeremiah learned some things. Right now, we might feel like we're up to our armpits in trouble. But we still have a job to do. As people with God's Holy Spirit are partakers of the new covenant and of the divine nature. As people with the law written in our minds and on our hearts. We have work to be doing here on this kingdom. That's preparing a people preaching the gospel, certainly, but we have personal work that we need to do. We can never give up working to improve ourselves. The time is coming when we're gonna to need to know those basics first. 
to put others first, to not react to situations with anger, but instead with God characteristic, chief characteristic of love. We'll have to learn to yield ourselves completely. We will have had to learn to be yielded completely to God. Our time for learning is here and now. So the question we need to be asking ourselves as people with God's spirit, that most precious gift dwelling in us, have I learned everything I need to learn? Have I learned everything I need to learn? Are there a few things I need to struggle or I still struggle with and I need to work on? I don't say this again to create doubt or fear in anyone's mind, but I say this so that going back to that first question, that most important question, not about when is the end of the age, but am I ready? I ask these questions today so that we can answer that question. Say, yes, I will be ready. God has given us the gift, the power of the Holy Spirit, that chief tool that we need to do this job. Today, we've looked at three questions that we can continually ask ourselves to make sure we will be able to answer that question. Yes, I am ready. I will rise in the air to meet Jesus Christ at his return. We need to take God's warnings seriously. Those given in Jeremiah's time, those given throughout the Bible. We need to discern the things that are going on in the world around us. Take warning from that. Listen, be astute. We can't blame our troubles on others. We need to accept responsibility for our own problems, and we need to work and recognize that in the end, the question isn't, what did someone else do? The question is, what did you do? What did you do? And as people who are teachers, will be teachers in the millennium, ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ, we can't wait to be learning life's big lessons. We need to learn those now. We need to learn to have ourselves yielded completely to God, to submit to the Holy Spirit. The time for us to know that, to learn those things, is here today. There isn't a later time for us to learn that. As first fruits of God's Holy Spirit, what this day, what the Feast of Pentecost is all about, these are hard questions we should be asking ourselves now so that we can answer that question later. Am I ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Yes, I am. God's words in Jeremiah contain powerful warnings. Powerful warnings that if we heed, if we listen to, we will be rising in the air to re at the return of Jesus Christ to rule and reign with him. They contain warnings, but you know, I'd like to end today on a magnificent promise that Jeremiah's words contain as well. Let's conclude in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. You know this scripture very well. And it's one that we should think about today, even as we consider the difficult questions. We should remember this promise that God makes to us through the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of a evil, to give you a future and a hope. Let us take these warnings to heart. Let us not make excuses and let us learn the things that we need to be learning here today, now. Let's never stop asking ourselves the tough questions as we push forward to our future and to our hope.